to the DIY Animation Show, where we get to the heart of what it means to be an independent animator. I'm Lauren Morse. And I'm Jessica Dahl. Together with our guests, we'll explore tips, tricks, the psychological, the fundamental, and above all, how to make whatever you can with whatever you've got. From the keys to the breakdowns and everything in between. The timing's right to do it yourself. Let's get rolling! To another episode of the DIY Animation Show. Yeah, hello. Today we've got part two of our interview with Batman Piderman creators Alex and Lindsay Small Butera. Nice. This time we find out where Alex and Lindsay feel DIY animation is headed. What it was like guest animating on a Clarence episode and directing their very own Adventure Time episode. We talk about beards, <laughs> fuzzy face rugs. <laughs> What a strong relationship with their audience did for Alex and Lindsay's Kickstarter. And having your voice be the drive of the things you make. Lindsay and Alex's determination to turn Bam and Piderman into a reality became the catalyst for a whole host of unexpected opportunities. It's going to be great! Oh yeah! So now that you've been part of the internet animation scene, where do you feel that DIY internet animation is headed? It's, it's weird right now because everything's in flux. With the internet, it changes, you know, year to year now. Like when we were starting, when we were in college, YouTube didn't exist, um, which is crazy that it's it's so prevalent now. Um, and before, the reason Batman Prairie Man, the first one, went viral is because it was back when um, YouTube had the same front page for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it got posted there by the YouTube staff. And then everybody saw it. And that's why it went so viral. But Things are really difficult now in terms of like, because YouTube, the algorithm, they changed everything. So it's difficult to make, it's it's almost impossible to make a living as an animator on YouTube personally. Yeah, YouTube is like pretty much exclusively, um, the best way to do it is like 15 yeah. minute content. Yeah. 15 minute chunks of content, like at least three times a week or daily. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can rock it. However, there is a lot of really cool stuff happening right now um, that's really helping animation, you know, the animation scene for indie creators basically which is streaming content starting in amazon and things like netflix are just plucking up all these brand new shows that are really new and it would be so hard to pitch to a studio and they're taking all these chances which is incredible and then there's stuff like kickstarter and patreon to fund projects that would never have been funded before and never would have seen the light of day and even youtube though it's not financially lucrative just for people who are animating for pleasure or for you know the sake of it um, can get their content seen by other people. And then there's other ways to kind of monetize it. Um, but I feel now more than ever, independent animation is becoming incredibly important. And I feel really, really blessed to be one of the, the people that have been able to be at the forefront of that to hopefully pave the way for people coming up behind us, you know, getting to work with bigger studios. Like we work for Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, and we've gotten to do all these incredible things. And I hope that that opens the door. Like now that we've done that and nobody's ever done that before, like, you know, with, when we did Adventure Time recently, basically Adventure Time crew gave us an Adventure Time episode and said, here you go, internet animators. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I directed it and they saw that it was possible to do that and it got done well and it had a great reception. So I'm hoping that this opens the door to all independent animators, you know, sort of that are working toward like being able to get their stuff seen. It's just becoming so important right now to be able to have a platform that way and, and all this content that would have never been seen before in the past, the way things were, um, you know, TV is kind of dissolving the web TV as we know it basically, um, which is scary for companies, but wonderful for internet people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have the privilege of like, you know, we were born before the internet existed. There was no internet when we were kids at all. Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> we've seen, you know, like we've seen the development of the internet over time. We've seen the development of like video games and movies and, and now everything is streaming. And we have the perspective of what it's like to work 
for TV or what it's like to work for the internet or what it's like to work for small freelance jobs for things that aren't really animation related. And, um, the perspective is basically everything's changing really quickly. Um, and it seems to be changing in a good way. There seems to become a, uh, like there's like a plethora of choices now. Like if you have some content you want to make or an idea, you almost have too many choices and, um, you kind of need to really narrow things down. Like, especially if you're just starting, it's hard to, you're not going to have, you know, your animations posted on every single social media. That's going to be too much work for okay. you. You have to specialize. The byproduct of this that is negative, the only negative I can really find is I've seen this in my students is they kind of, even in their um, exercises that they're supposed to be using to um, just gain skill, like stuff, they, they're they trying to make it so that it's internet ready to sh show off kind of thing rather than, you know, using it as an opportunity to just screw around and practice basically and, and get better. You know, you, not every project has to be perfect to already like become a viral video on the internet. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of the, the attitude that, okay, people are going to see this. What are they going to think completely holds you back when you're trying to learn? Yeah, I feel like that ties back into just making content for yourself too, though. And people will come, you know? Yeah, right. But all in all, it's so <clears throat> positive right now. And so now that tools are so easy to find to just start animating, anybody can animate. So we're getting, you know, animated works from like high school kids that, you know, will later become the next generation of people who are doing important animation. It's incredible that anybody can animate now. And I feel like we're, it's a, it's a halcyon time. And there are definitely growing pains with how the internet is. And like, people are still trying to figure it out. And like, companies are coming in and trying to monetize stuff. So it gets a little hairy. But all in all, this is an incredible time to be an independent in any field, I feel. And and at this time, it's even more apparent that the fundamentals and the basics of animation are even more important because you have so many people have the opportunity to animate. You're getting so much terrible animation out there, <laughs> like just because of the fact that so many people can do it. Mm. Um, so there's, there seems to be a, you know, there's a there's a deficit in, in the fundamentals that but we've been kind of noticing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's everything's changed already. Like the the industry is like the rock has been punched in. It's all different. The landscape has already been decimated. In the, in new new is rising up from the decimated <laughs> land, <laughs> which is incredible. And you know, I already feel like I'm only 30 years old, and I already feel like you know the younger crowd coming up now is what is you know we're already old old hat. <laughs> so it's like it's cool. It's cool to see the rise of this and be privy to both sides of it. It's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Just along that line, I feel like that's so true just in terms of uh, trying to remember to make content just for yourself and not for kind of like the invisible people watching over your shoulder on the internet. <laughs> like that sort of a mindset where it feels like someone's going to be seeing your work and judging the work and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, wanting to put content online and show mm -hmm. all that for people and but also being able to practice fundamentals. Do you guys have any tips for how you can practice your fundamentals or even just how to focus on making work for yourself without thinking of the social media audience? I think that's a really important thing. I actually was talking to Alex about this the other day. Um, it's sort of like we're all pressured now to kind of have um, our life on display on social media and like be kind of personal everywhere now. Um, and that's sort of kind of I feel like it deteriorates your psyche a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like you have to kind of remind yourself that not everything has to be for public consumption, I guess, like of your life, like details of your life and things like that, um, because it can actually make you feel really bad, I feel like depressed. So I think keeping in mind that, you know, you started out on this to make things for you and, you know, also keeping in mind that what you make for you will find a place, you know, and people will respond to it and like respond to it sincerely. Like that's, I feel like all of our success has come from that. Like we, we don't pander. We make really weird stuff that's not accessible to everyone, but the people who like it, like it, and they like it very much. And so it's just like finding your place, but being true to yourself and making sure you're practicing fundamentals. Please make sure you're practicing. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think the danger of putting everything online is that the environment of what someone has made that is theirs, that they don't want copied or stolen um, can kind of really damage what you try to make. Everyone's desperately trying to be unique and desperately trying to be original. But um, there's a problem in, in you know, you learn when you're a kid, you just copy art. Like you see a drawing you like, you just copy that drawing. Like I, I remember like going through a comic book and just like like line for line imitating the art and not questioning for a second whether that was okay or not and not thinking I'm going to post this online, what kind of response will it get? 
Like, um, I think, I think, um, copying for the sake of learning is, is hugely important. And then, you know, when you're, when you're making something that people are going to see, you're going to affect it some way that that is going to affect it. And if everything you say and everything you do and everything you're thinking about is online for public view, then you're not being completely true to the kind of person you are when no one's watching. Like you need to be, um, you need to take care of both of those things. You need to, you need to be aware of what it's like when other people are seeing your art, but you also need to be, you know, what do you, what do you actually think about and actually care about? And, you know, not like what other people think come in, you know, you need to make art about that stuff too. Just to like have a good sense of self, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. Like, and I agree with that. Like just have a sense of who you are when you're alone, when you're not like on you know, on, I'm doing quotations with my fingers, but you can't <laughs> just like, just be yourself and that's fine. And take care of yourself. So. You guys give such good answers. <laughs> Seriously. Like I've just been like sitting back, just looking like, this is so nice. Okay, you, guys are, you guys are just wonderful. My goodness. Yeah. It's super encouraging. It's really lovely. It's, it's really making me want to start doing personal projects again. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I want to encourage everybody. Everybody in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you will manage that <laughs> easily. <laughs> so because of your super fantastic work on Batman Spider Man, <laughs> you guys gained the attention of major studio Cartoon Network and were given the opportunity to be guest animators on not just a Clarence episode, but also an Adventure Time episode. And most recently, with Nickelodeon, a little Spongebob vine, <laughs> which is just the bee's knees. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> most welcome. Can you tell us how those came about? Um, interestingly enough, actually, I, we were working with Cartoon Network a long time ago as well. Actually, when I was still in school and Alex had graduated because mm-hmm. he was a year ahead of me because I stayed on for a second major, I actually had then I had pitched to them an idea that I had made a pitch Bible for and they bought it. So I was working with Cartoon Network with Alex for about a year um, back in, what year was that? Like 20? It was 08. 08? 08 or 09. Um, And I almost went to series, but it kind of, like they went to Cartoon Network Real at that time and things got shuffled around there um, and a lot of projects fell through and ours was one of them. Um, So then much later, you know, we'd always been fans of Cartoon Network after that. And everybody we had worked with when we had initially worked there was lovely and super great. And so a couple, is it like two years ago we were working on Clarence now? Or is that a year and a half? Uh, Probably a year and a half. I have no concept of time anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Every day I like Jumanji it. I'm like, what day is it? (laughs) Um, You have a beard all of a sudden. I do. I don't know where, I look very distinguished now though. And that's good. (laughs) I like it. You like it? It's good. Really? (laughs) (laughs) I like that he looked at me like I really had one. It was was good. Um, But um, so the Clarence people, we love Clarence. I love Clarence. That's probably my favorite show on Cartoon Network. Yeah, we we just like sit on the couch and are praising the episode for a good like 15 minutes after it ends every time. (laughs) It's animated so well. It has some of the best board artists on it. It's so charming and hilarious and weird. And like, it's sort of Batman Spider Man esque in a way. Um, and I, that's why I, I like dig on to that. I'm like, oh, cool. It's just the kind of content I think. Um, it's, it's like what being a kid was actually like. Yes. Yes. Like your memory of things you did. Be, it's making me remember things I did as a kid it's so in a very authentic way. It's yeah, so authentic and sincere. I just love it. Um, wow. But back a while ago, they actually approached us first to do a short. And we, we were like, oh, yeah, totally. And then they were like, instead, let's do an episode. And we were like, oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love the Clarence crew. They are incredible. Like Spencer and... I want to say no. I want to keep wanting to call. I know. Nelson. I know. <laughs> yeah. The characters over there are based on members of the crew, but the names are flopped. Like one of what? our, the guy we were working with, Nelson, yeah. who is incredible, and he's working on games now. Uh, Nelson Bowles. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, he's Nelson Bowles. But the character is Nelson Knowles. Bells and Knowles. Is yeah. the bully so we have, to, we have to manually <laughs> switch those letters every time we're thinking about. Um, <laughs> but we got to work with a lot of really great people over there, and it was such a fantastic experience. And we got to do lots of weird animation for them, which was really, really fun. Yeah, they want us to do this special sequence where the kids are staying up all night. And because they're like they 10 and staying up all night, yeah. they're like, yeah, they're losing their minds. Uh, we, did a ton- we did a lot for it, and we did some things too that 
I think people can't tell that it is us during it because mm. it fits so seamlessly. Like some of it we did kind of wacky, but a lot of it we did seamless work for. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that was really fun. And then after that, actually, um, the showrunner for Adventure Time, the current showrunner, Adam, Adam Muto, who is an excellent dude. He's been a fan of Batman Perryman forever. Like he donated too much money to the Kickstarter. He's like a good, a good boy. Um, <laughs> he approached us after now that we work for them, Cartoon Network, like that. He's like, now I can finally, you know, I'm pulling you in. And we were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if we have to. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so great. And I thought it was going to be like Clarence where they were, you know, they directed and we did a little bit of sequence, but they were like, they basically gave us 80% of an episode and said, do what you want. You can do whatever you want. You directed it and you can make it look like however you want and goodbye for three months and I was like oh my god okay cool (laughs) that's amazing yeah just to expand on that a little more as guest animators you you guys must have had a certain amount of creative freedom when you were working on the shows what was your experience like merging your vision with what the studio required on Adventure Time it was so good because they basically let us do whatever we want like I would be like how about this and they were like cool (laughs) like they were they were really supportive and into everything that we were doing um they basically gave us entire creative freedom on the adventure time thing so it was initially boarded by co kim uh, whose boards are really great um but then they gave us the boards and they're like you can alter them however you want we got the boards and the audio yeah they already had the audio and this unlike their other guest episodes where they've had other guest animators on adventure time uh this one's canonical because we didn't write it but i got to we, we reboarded the whole thing and got to write little jokes and stuff. The audio was already locked, so we didn't get to write audio jokes, but we did all of the gags. It was just really fun. And we got to work with Matt Cummings, who I wanted really bad to work with for the yeah. background. He was a dream to art direct, and he's a he's more of a classical digital painter. Um, so when he came on, I don't know if, if you have seen the Adventure Time short, they're, um, the backgrounds are really strange and odd. And I kind of like, <laughs> I worked with him on it, um, getting the look down. And I sent him a folder that had like 50 reference images in it. And I was like, you know, like this. And he was, he's a classical painter. And I was like, is that okay? And he came back after working with me on some color stuff. And he showed us incredible comps. It was exactly, yeah, it was like it he was pulled amazing. it out of my head. <laughs> it was like he took a screenshot of my brain and was like, I've done it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was wonderful to get to work with Matt and get to kind of direct it the way I want it to look and feel. And I, I'm very proud of us. <laughs> yeah. And I'm very grateful um, for all that Cartoon Network did with us and taking a chance on us. They were so supportive and so great. And with Clarence, we got to do a lot of fun back and forth with them, just on things like... Um, yeah, because they were mostly like like individual, you know, 10, 5, 10, 3, 2 second scenes. Yeah. And, and they were sort of like, okay, for this one, what do we do? And each one was sort of like a new little yeah. gag, or how are we going to make this silly, or what are we going to do here? And They let me pitch a lot so of gags fun. for it, like the bat gag was sort of like they had an initial thing in their script for it and I'm like what if we make it gross and they were like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were really open to that and then uh we also got to work on a clearance short which isn't out yet but whenever it does um I got to write it which I was excited about and then we got to do all the boards for it yeah we actually haven't even seen it yet we did like I assume it's good <laughs> <laughs> we basically did like, the rough animation for yeah it, really. it was really fun to get to write for those characters and just yeah. such a great experience we love Cartoon Network they are incredible <laughs> And Nick, too, when we worked for Spongebob, um, again, they were like, do whatever you want. And we were like, okay. <laughs> and so we got to kind of come up with goofy ideas for it. We've been, like, working hard enough for long enough. And, you know, the the things we care about are pretty much all in Batman and Spider-Man. So and people, work, yeah. yeah, people pretty much know what we're about. They just so kind of leave stuff. That are, they're like, they we can... like what you do, so just do whatever you want. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> 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 Give me the <this> power. <laughs> We've had such great experiences. We're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's super cool. Yeah. So with working on Batman Piter Man, it sounds like there was a lot of trust just in general, like with you guys guest animating on the shows, which is just absolutely wonderful. And it's totally warranted just uh, from the work that you see from Batman Piter Man. It's absolutely great. Were there any differences working in a major studio or, or even just with a major studio versus working on your own thing? Um, just basically having to answer to other people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> When we're alone, we're, we're alone. But um, working for other people, you know, you do have to be kind of updating them pretty often on what you're doing just so they know that, you know, it's proceeding as as planned. Yeah, yeah. Um, like when we're working on our own, we answer to the show, basically. It's like it's all about what the show needs 
But um, yeah. when we're working with other people, it's, it's, you know, what do these people want for their show? Yeah, so it, there's more collaboration when we're working with other people, which I actually really like. I like, I like both ways. Like, I like being kind of in my cave and kind of doing it on my own. But I also really have learned a lot. Like, especially when we were working with Nelson on Clarence, I learned a lot about sort of a different kind of anime. Like, he, he would, like, draw on our drawings and stuff and, like, He'd be like, oh, just change this one frame. And I'd be like, that's incredible. I never thought to do that. Yeah, that was a really cool part of working on those shows is because the people we were working with were like top tier in terms of skill. So getting feedback from people at that level was great. It was Mm. super helpful. And that's one thing that I think we both sort of miss from Studio Life is sort of a collaborative environment. It's, It's always great to have lots of art people around to bounce off of. So being home, there's so many great perks to it, but also I do miss having a, a Halloween party. <laughs> <laughs> things like that. It's great to be able to have other other eyes on your stuff and like kind of to catch things you would no- not normally catch. Mm, yeah, I love it. Jumping back a little bit, you guys ran a Batman Spider Man Kickstarter back in 2014, and not only did you reach your goal of 50,000, but you blew it out of the water. I think uh, you made almost like $113,000, which is absolutely amazing. <laughs> so huge congrats for Thank one. You. <laughs> Thank from. you. And uh, what prompted you guys to run a Kickstarter? So when Mondo had put it on off, you know, on hold, um, a lot of people were really sad. We, when we did end it back then, we tried to end it on, you know, there, there was back then I'd already written the ending of the series. It was always meant to end, but just not where it had. So I tried to, we tried to make it end really nicely when it could, we didn't know if it would ever be able to come back. But then, you know, a couple, a year or so after that, I guess, Mondo had wanted us to maybe do a Kickstarter and they had talked about for some other things. And we were, I was always kind of like, no, 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 you know, it, it, it got complicated and I didn't want to complicate it because it's not meant to be complicated. But then sort of we got approached by Bread Pig, which is a company that does a lot of uh, Kickstarter running stuff. And we happen to be friends with the guy who owns it. And they kind of wined and dined us and told me about all the good things that could happen during it and how, you know, finally getting to end it. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I really want to be able to finish this story because so many people care about it and I still care about it. And um, Alex and I sort of both decided that that would be really good to do. And we approached Mondo and told them the plan and they were super jazzed and so excited and really supportive. Um, yeah, so that sort of is what kind of brought it, brought it to be. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's wonderful. Have you found any differences between making the last five episodes using Kickstarter funds as opposed to when you were initially making Batman Spider-Man? We can, we can eat now so much. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good. That is a very good thing. (laughs) Like, I don't know if anybody else has noticed it, but we've tried to up the quality significantly because people, you know, very generously uh, donated to our Kickstarter. So we're like, we want to make it as good as possible for them. So Mm. we've hired a musician to work with us. So it's not just Alex and I making tinkly sounds on a keyboard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, which has been great having money to be able to actually hire people to help us to make it as good as possible, which means having a musician, I'm able to hire people to help color. So it's not just me in a dark room, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, things like that have been great. So we've tried to up the quality. They've all been much longer. Um, the ones that have already come out are all, they're all very long compared to the other episodes. Um, just like the quality has gone up significantly. Yeah. And part of the, part of the main reason, part of the main goal after we decided to do the Kickstarter was that we want to offer the fans, um, some sort of thing to, to own. Like we've never really offered any, anything for them to purchase before and, and they've, they've wanted to so badly. So we actually kind of skewed the Kickstarter to be pretty heavy on the rewards. Yeah. It actually, most of the Kickstarter funds, like uh, not most of them, but a huge majority of them, more than normal Kickstarters went towards making really nice merchandise for the rewards for people who donated. Cause that was really important to us. Like in the end, we're not looking to make bank on it. We don't need to, you know, we don't want yeah. to, it's, you know, it's special in a different way to us. So we wanted to make really great merchandise that people could finally have. Cause we get, we were getting so many inquiries, people who wanted to buy it for their kids for Christmas, things like all the yeah. time. And I never have anything to offer them, but we were able to make incredible merchandise for the Kickstarter. Like the pumpkin plush is the coolest thing. I was yeah. going to say, I was going to mention the pumpkin. It's amazing. So it's made by Wheel of Fine. So the quality is incredible on it. It's, yeah. and it's so big. It's like, was it like 14 inches tall? It's so mm-hmm. big. Oh my goodness. And like they're great t-shirts and just everything was great. 
there's something I really like too in the fact that like Pumpkin is probably like one of the most grounded characters out of everybody and like yeah. and he's oh. the one that's, that's like cute like plushy stuff in <laughs> <And> I, <laughs> I, I love it he's I love the it. heartthrob he's the breakout <laughs> it's <myself>. true <laughs> Love yeah, I was going to say I was drooling over the uh, the idea of the actual lenticular postcardy gift. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. Genius. Those are so fun. They're beautiful. Yeah. How did you guys come up with that idea? For like, that's such a great idea. The gentleman over at Bread Pig, George Rohack, it was actually his idea, I believe, for the lenticulars. Right? Yeah. He he hooked us up with the people at Wheel of Fine, and yeah. he he was like, "Here's the best way to do shirts, and if you can do so post, posters, do it this way." And I mean, that's part. That's yeah. why we hired Bread Pig. Um, but rather than do like, you know, we did do posters, but instead of doing crazy posters or prints, we were like, you know, he was like, "Why don't you do an animated one?" Since it's animated, we were like. Oh my God, you're right. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> and he knew the, the company that made those is called Gift Pop. And they're incredible. Actually, yeah, they're if great. You, if you go to their website, they have ones that are like, you can do 16 frame ones. Oh my goodness. What? Which, which is yeah, insane. they're cool. They're pretty cheap. And oh, yeah. they're really easy to work with. They shipped really quickly. Yeah, and, they gave yeah, us a cool. discount for doing a ton of ordering from them. Mm-hmm. And the printing on them is lovely. And they're so great. They're not like old lenticular stuff for when we were kids, like pogs that you know, have a skull that turned into... <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not like... Um, the quality. A 3D lenticular no, thing. No, no. Although they, they might actually have that. I don't even know. I have no idea. They, but they're, they're probably capable. But um, it's, it's, yeah, it's basically just frames. Yeah, here's my advert for gift pop. They're cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can order your own and everything. You can just get your own yeah, custom. You don't cool. have to order like 100. They're just like fun gifts for people. <laughs> yeah, actually it is. It's like a good present. Yeah. <laughs> I always like think about ordering more just like a fun stuff to give out like, to, yeah. like family. Like, <laughs> like reaction gifts to hand no, to people. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You pulled it in my brain now. <laughs> <laughs> just pull out whatever reaction gift you want, just whenever you need it. Just like I need. Pachoo. <laughs> Happy. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Do you guys have any tips for people considering running a Kickstarter for their own DIY animation project? Um, yes. I guess it would be, it's really, 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 really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's way more work than you think. Um, the whole time the Kickstarter is running, you are your full time job is the Kickstarter, yeah. and you will be freaking out the whole time. <laughs> and constantly <laughs> emailing you. It it changes your life. It's incredibly difficult. I wouldn't recommend it for people who don't have an established fan base. There are so many projects that are animation projects that um, pop up and they look cool, but since they don't have an established fan base or they're like trying to fund to make a pilot for something, it's like you need to kind of have a proof of concept already there. Like the reason Batman Prairie Man works is because it had like at that point five years of animation and an hour of animation already behind it. Mm. I think a lot of Kickstarters that are looking to create something new and don't have like a pre-established kind of um, backing under them fail on Kickstarter and then they're not sure why, but it's, it's, it's just because of that. Yeah. I feel like you need to have a really good proof of concept and a proof of your ability to work yeah. hard enough. Cause you Kickstarter know? is hard. I mean, like a lot of people, Kickstarters fall through all the time, I think. Yeah. And, um, they shouldn't have to just trust you. You should have the, the work should speak for itself yeah. and that should be what gets you the funds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically like, I guess the, it would be akin to convincing investors to back your project. So Kickstarter is just really difficult. Just think hard about it beforehand. Consider Patreon first, you know, consider other options before Kickstarter. But if you, if you come to Kickstarter and you're like, this is the way to do it. Kickstarter is really great. And they were really, really good to us. Like the people who run Kickstarter are really great and like it was it was a really great platform it's just incredibly difficult so it's a lot to do <laughs> mm. <laughs> no that makes a lot of sense i feel like it would just be a ton of work do you think in terms of establishing a fan base what sort of marker can you hit to where you're like okay i think this is enough of a fan base that i can potentially run a kickstarter it's actually i don't even know because when we when we were starting our kickstarter i kept trying to get i was talking to george who's the bread pig guy and alex and i'd be like we can't ask for $50,000. That's that's a lot of money. And they were like, yeah, it takes that much. I'm like, I know, but we have to keep putting it down. Nobody's going to, you know, give us as much as this. We're going to, you know, we can't do this. And then they were like, trust me, trust me. George was like, trust me, trust me. And I was like, okay. And, I, and when it went live, I'm like, we're never going to make this goal. We're never going to make this goal. It's going to be too hard. And then we made it in two days. Um, so I'm not a good person to ask because I have no idea how anything works. <laughs> like our fan base kind of came very organically. And I don't know. I'm a, a shy, small woman. <laughs> Literally small last name. <laughs> 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 I'm for laughing at that, Alex. I appreciate it. <laughs> 
I, I, I don't know. I'm just very grateful that we have cool people who think we're cool and like watching the stuff that we make. Um, I mean, I think it would be a pitfall to say, I'm going to do this work and make this series so that I can eventually kickstart it. Like, I don't think, I don't think there should be a metric for that. I think it should just be, I mean, you're working and making art and things are going yeah. how they're going. And if, if you feel like the opportunity is there, I mean, I don't know. There's a way to gauge how many fans you actually have, how many hits your videos have, how yeah. many people follow you on Twitter, how many people actually interact with you, how devoted is your fan base? So they just like get a quick laugh and they leave. Like the view count is not a good measure of how much people care. Like our Kickstarter was only funded by 2000 people. And our videos have like, some of them have like 3 million hits. Four some of them have 400,000 hits, but only 2000 people were needed to make the Kickstarter work. So you don't really need that many people. I have no idea. how It's it really works. hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess just think about it sincerely and approach it sincerely. Um, you know, try to keep a cool head about it and it will, it'll be easier to figure out. I feel. Yeah. <laughs> That's, oh, yeah, that's... No, that's absolutely fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You know, we've talked about just how wonderful your fan base is. It's just, they're absolutely wonderful. And, you know, and you mentioned that you would do live streams, you'd interact with them. And I feel like with, just from what you've said about, like, you had a day job, and then you were working on Batman, Spider man on top of that, and then you were also interacting with the fans, like... I love people, but like, <laughs> I, I do need a bit of, <laughs> whew, that could be, <laughs> that could be tiring. If you're not careful, I would think. What was it like interacting with fans? And was that a very organic thing? Um, I had to learn kind of how to where there, there was a line because it would be stuff like <laughs> one time a fan got stranded in Boston and I went and picked him up and he slept over. <laughs> Couch. And I was like, are you hungry? Like, I was like, are you okay? Like, I went and I picked him up. And I, some that's, high school kid. that's kind of some stuff I shouldn't probably be doing. And then after that, <laughs> there was a different time where this other kid was like, he was like one of the kids in the live stream all the time. He's like, I'm stranded here and I haven't, you know, eaten. It's cool. And I ran, I made him lunch and I ran over and I'm like, please eat, you dummy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had to learn to kind of put a little barrier there because I was sort of like friending everyone and allowing everyone in. It, it, it was just too much after a while. Like, I'm yeah. like, you were like, you have to stop. You're right. And I'm like, but, but I have to take care of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but our fan base definitely grew organically just over time. You know, we never kind of tried to cultivate it. We just kind of put work out and we're not incredibly personal on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. I do like to keep a bit of myself on the, the DL, but. Yeah, we want to keep the interest in the show. We're like the reason, the reason we're doing this is, is to make the art. And yeah. we got, we've gotten the success we've gotten from just working really hard on the art and caring about the art. Yeah. And caring and about the people who watch it. You yeah. Know, and genuinely. It's, it's never, it's not a ploy. I really want everybody to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could tell just by talking with, with you both that you could tell that's a very genuine statement. <laughs> from, from <laughs> but that's another thing I have to kind of turn off in order to kind of function. I, I get to wrapped up in that kind of thing <laughs> like take, trying to force to take care of everybody so mm -hmm. i have to i've had to pull back a little bit now that we've gotten a bit more fame <laughs> so that i don't go insane <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have to like <laughs> i was about to say physically draw a line and then i imagine like drawing a line on like the <laughs> computer monitor uh but <laughs> as batman Spider man's popularity began to rise and you realized okay i can't like talk with everybody that's commenting on the video or I can't go and drive out to every fan or anything like that, which that's, that's super sweet, by the way. Um, oh. <laughs> how did you regulate how much like you interacted with fans while being able to maintain your own level of sanity as well, too, because you still need the energy to create the show and have lives as well, too? I think it just, again, it sort of happened organically because once you get over a certain follower account, you can't read everything that people send you. You just can't. It's like impossible. So I can't even try to possibly do that. So it sort of just kind of made its own line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. kind of like they were when there's so many people talking to you, you can't answer them all. When only, you know, a certain amount of people are talking to you, you can take it all in. But like we're at that point where we can't take it all in and I just have to kind of hope that they know I care anyway and <laughs> things like that. Yeah. I'm sure they know. Again, I am very, very positive <laughs> that they know. I hope they know. <laughs> I don't think there'll be in any doubt after this episode goes out. <laughs> it's just an hour of me crying. Like, just I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay and Al 
Alex created Batman Piderman. It was with the sole intention of making something they personally would enjoy. Ironically, it was that singular, quirky, personal taste that ultimately connected them with the wide audience they so deeply care for today. When have you been surprised by your unique weirdness connecting you to a community? We'd love to hear about it. So come to oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash DIYA2. That's the number two. And tell us about it in the comments. Or if there's anything else you've enjoyed in this episode, we'd love to hear about that too. (laughs) Next time in part three of Alex and Lindsay's interview, we discuss harnessing humor through authenticity. The great connector that is the internet. Ooh. And we find out what they feel DIY animators need the most, which includes a more reliable path to creating than just inspiration. It's a good one. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on this episode or any other episode of the DIY animation show, please consider going to iTunes and giving us a rating and a review. While you're there, you can also subscribe. Whoa! Yeah! (laughs) And you never miss an episode. That's right. Cool beans, animation buds. We will see you on the flip flop. Follow your heart and have fun animating. The DIY Animation Show is a production of the Oatly Academy of Visual Storytelling. We're your hosts, Jessica Dahl and Lauren Morse. Our producer is Chris Oatley. Our assistant producers are Anya Marcos and Ejua Ebeneba. Our mix engineer is Z John Yan. Our theme music was provided by Azio Flux. Subscribe at DIYanimation.show. Find more art and story podcasts featuring insights from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, vis effects, comics, and children's books at friendsofdiya.com. We'll see you next time. Ironically, it was that singular, quirky personal taste that ultimately connected them with the wide audience they so deeply care for today. When have you been surprised? Every time. (laughs) Surprised. Not subscribed. (laughs) Surprised. When have you been surprised by your... When have you... When have you been... When have you been surprised?